Hello, and welcome to Lecture 1 of Motion in a Plane in Phys 1104. The first thing we need to do in this unit is revisit how we represent motion and generalize it so that the methods we already know will be adapted to work for motions that aren't in one dimension. We're going to start with a specific example. We're going to have a cart, which is moving along at a constant velocity, and an object attached to it, which can be dropped. And what we see when we view this through a camera, which is fixed to the lab bench, so it's in the earth frame, is that the dropped object follows a curved path. On the other hand, if we view it through a camera which is attached to the cart, the object falls straight down. And so what this shows us is that the shape of the object's observed path depends on the motion of the observer. Now that may seem like it's a complication, but in fact it leads to a simplification. Because notice that the path of this object is much simpler when viewed in the cart frame. It's a nice straight line motion that we already know how to think about, compared to how it looks in the earth frame. The thing we now need to get used to is that in one dimension every vector we ever thought about was parallel to every other vector, but that's no longer true in two dimensions. So for example, in one dimension your average velocity over an interval was always parallel to the instantaneous velocity at every instant in that time interval. Some of your instantaneous velocities could point in the opposite direction, but they were still parallel. Similarly, the acceleration was always parallel to the velocity, and in particular if it pointed in the same direction, then the object was speeding up, and if it pointed in the opposite direction, then the object was slowing down. But neither of these are true in two dimensions, although the last one to do with how the acceleration points relative to the velocity will have a similar but slightly more complicated rule. In particular, let's look at how the average velocity and instantaneous velocity are generally not parallel by looking at a very simple example. And this example is simple because it's really two one-dimensional motions that have been stitched together. Because first this object moves in one direction and then in another. Note, if you look at these two average velocities from time 6 to time 7 and time 7 to time 8, and now think about instantaneous velocity at time 7. It must be in the same direction as them, but it would be intermediate in size between them. But now think about the average velocity, which you can think of as how fast and in what direction the object would have had to go at a constant velocity to end up in the same place. So let's think about from time 0 to time 7. So we need to use a displacement vector to find the average velocity, and here's the displacement vector we need. And that tells us that the average velocity from time 0 to time 7 would be in this direction. And the whole point here is that that average velocity is not parallel to the instantaneous velocity at time 7. In particular, in this case, that average velocity isn't parallel to the velocity that this object was going at any time in between time 0 and time 7. So with our specific example of the object that's been dropped from the cart, how does this play out? Well, let's look at the instantaneous velocity at a particular time. Because it's how fast and in what direction the object is going right now, then it has to be tangent to the path that the object follows. For any object following any path, we call that path the trajectory. That's all we mean by trajectory, the path that any object is following in its motion. And the instantaneous velocity has to be tangent to the path. So, for example, at time 13, the instantaneous velocity must look like this. But now let's think about the average velocity. And again, we can get that from a displacement. And so here's the displacement vector from time 5 to time 13, and that tells us that the average velocity over that interval points like this. And just note that that average velocity is not in the same direction as the instantaneous velocity at time 13. 
although it is quite similar to the instantaneous velocity at time 9, and this is something I mentioned in a much earlier video lecture, that the average velocity vector over some interval is often a good approximation for the instantaneous velocity vector halfway through that time interval. Let's now see how this vector subtraction that is involved in calculating an average velocity plays out in a very general situation. So I've made a motion that sort of includes everything including the kitchen sink. It's got speeding up in a straight line, slowing down in a straight line, constant velocity, going around a corner at constant speed, going around a corner while slowing down, and going around a corner while speeding up. That's all the possibilities. And I've put the acceleration vectors on for the cases that we already know. When it's speeding up in a straight line, the acceleration points in the direction of motion. When it's slowing down in a straight line, the acceleration points opposite to the direction of motion, and constant velocity means zero acceleration. But let's now see, by carrying out the vector subtractions, how it turns out for the other three cases. So let's now use this process of vector subtraction to estimate the acceleration vector at this circled time here. And so I'm going to choose to use this this velocity vector just after it as my vf, and the velocity vector just before it as my vi. And so I'm going to copy those vectors out. And here is my vi, roughly. And remember that I need to flip my vi end for end to get negative vi. So I'm going to draw that. And so now I'm going to take my vf and I'm going to add my negative vi to it. And my result points this way. And so notice if I just copy that over, it points inward into the curve and roughly perpendicular to the direction that the object would be going right at this moment. So now let me do the same process for this moment here when this object is going around a corner while speeding up. And I've already copied out my VF and VI vectors. And remember that what I need to do is flip my VI so that I have negative VI. So it looks roughly like this. And now I'm going to add my negative VI to my VF. And so notice that this time, if I copy that up here, that acceleration vector is not perpendicular to the direction of motion. The direction of motion is roughly like this, and so perpendicular to it is roughly like this, and that vector is pointing forward of that. We'll see why in a little while. So now let me finish up by doing this case over here where it's slowing down while turning and I've copied out my VI and my VF and I've already made my flipped around negative VI and I'm going to take my VF and my, v, my negative VI and add them. And if I copy that over here, you see that it is not perpendicular or parallel to the motion. The direction perpendicular to the motion would be roughly like this. And so this is pointing into the curve and somewhat back. And again, we'll see why in a little while. So now I'm going to pose a question to you. And if you're in my course and you're viewing this video through Moodle, you'll now be asked a question on Moodle that's just this question. And you'll have to answer it before you go on to the next video. If you're not viewing this through Moodle, then please do come up with your answer before you go on to part two of the video. So here is our object that's been dropped from the cart, and here are some motion diagrams of it. And these motion diagrams have the acceleration vectors added, and the only difference between them is the acceleration vectors.
which of them is the most correct motion diagram for this object? And I'll say, from previous things you've learned in this course, you have all kinds of ways of coming up with the correct answer here.